there's a power to this film. Uh, there's a poignancy. And frankly, for those of us of a certain age, there's a great deal of pain uh, as this country went through hell. But it came back. And one hopes today that given the polarization of this society that we can once again find the inspiration to come back. I would like uh, every single student of the Humphrey Institute to watch this. They must watch it. Otherwise, uh, we won't give them a degree. <laughs> now we're going to hear from two people who have lived this experience. Um, Bill Moyers, uh, the famous Bill Moyers who you see on television all the time, was the press secretary uh, to Lyndon Johnson in the White House. Uh, he, he was a very close friend of Hubert Humphrey. And Norman Sherman, who was the press secretary uh, to Hubert Humphrey, who you saw in the film as well. There, I know that uh, when you have a film that is captivated, as captivating as this, people don't want to go out into the rain right away. They want to reflect a bit on it. And so we're going to ask these two gentlemen to reflect on this, on this film and their own experience with Hubert Humphrey. And let me say first, I mean, first of all, you've got two former press secretaries up here. Norman was, was um, Hubert's press secretary when he was vice president. I was Lyndon Johnson's press secretary for two years when he was president. And our credibility mutually was so low we couldn't believe our own leaks. Uh, <laughs> so you, 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 you can take what we say tonight at face value, right? But <laughs> what I do want to say sincerely is what a powerful film Mick and his team have done. I've produced over a thousand hours of television and I've seen almost every important political uh, documentary done in the last 30 years and I've never, this one will stand the test of time for future generations who want to see a moment in American politics and a person in American politics which show the interrelationship between character and circumstance, between coincidence and, and, and accident. And the great thing you've done with this film is to reverberate the themes throughout the last 50 years, so it seems like we were just talking about yesterday. To think of the, of the search for that footage, to seek hundreds of interviews, hundreds of hours of interviews, and then take them of a long, poignant and, and event-driven life and reduce them to two compelling hours is a, is, is a work of art. I can tell you that watching that on a big screen has just devastated me. After years of working with Hubert Humphrey, watching it on film is, is overwhelming. So if I don't make any sense, please excuse me. <laughs> if you noticed Richard Nixon at his funeral, you ought to know why that miserable guy was there. As Humphrey decided as he was dying that Nixon should be at the funeral. And he called him and Nixon said, no, I haven't been back to Washington since I left. Humphrey said, you must come to my funeral. And Nixon ultimately gave in. He struggled with it, but it was the beginning of a Humphrey just felt that if you've been president of the United States, you ought to be treated in a way different from exclusion or uh, anything that's insulting. And Nixon's resurrection was Humphrey's in his dying days. And that's it. Mr. Morris? No. Uh, imagine if Nixon had not pulled his dirtiest trick and Hubert Humphrey had been president. Just imagine there would have been no Watergate. The war would have ended sooner. We would have had a different country uh, than we have today if Hubert had won. Um, being vice president to Lyndon Johnson when he was angry with you, uh, the gates of hell looked like they were lovely compared to... You know, he, to I used to, I've said often that he was 13 of the most uh, uh, interesting and perplexing men I've ever known, Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> he, uh, he was the best dancer in the White House since George Washington, and at the same time, he could be the, as, as crude as Andrew Jackson. Uh, he could be magnanimous one day, and the next 
day he could oh, yeah. be ruthless in his and callous in his uh, denigration. Well, there were some days that weekends they would invite both Muriel and Hubert Humphrey over, and they were just embracing, just wonderful. But then by Tuesday he might lose it, and I, you know I don't know the psychology what you would do with it. But Johnson was an erratic lover, and political lover, and um, man. Well, I, I I wore out early. I mean I I left in January of '67 and went to be publisher of Newsday in New York. And here's a side story: I, as publisher, I went over to the Paris Peace Talks to see what was what I could find out as a journalist. I had no, I never heard from Lyndon Johnson after I left the White House again. Hubert Humphrey called my wife, Judith, at home and said, after I announced my resignation, and said, tell him I understand. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, but anyway, I never saw, but Hubert, but Lyndon Johnson told me in the summer of 64 when he was talking about Humphrey and why it was inevitable that he would be president, that that speech, which is what also, also Hubert referred to it. That speech in 40, 1948, July of 1948, at the Democratic National Convention was the most courageous political act of the century. And his, his reasoning for that is because, well, he, he was a great politician, Johnson. He knew every man's price and he knew the consequences of what decisions would mean. And he knew the pressure Humphrey was under at that moment. He was only 40. 45, 40, no, 37. No, Humphrey was 37, mayor of Minneapolis. He had done an amazing job here on civil rights, on, on, on human rights. You remember some of you with gray in your hair that he had sent 600 volunteers out through the streets of, of, of Minneapolis to do this survey of discrimination in the city. He sent them to schools, to businesses, to factories, to homes. And he said, I want a mirror to hold up to, uh, for Minneapolis to see itself in that mirror. So he sent these 600 volunteers out through Minneapolis. I know this because we talk about it at times. And uh, they came back with this report. He mobilized the city council to get behind the report of, of, of the commission. He suspended a policeman who accused a traffic violator in downtown Minneapolis of being a dirty Jew. He, op he saw to it that the doors of this city were open to blacks, to uh, Jews, and to Indians. Norwegians. Norwegians. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the astonishing thing, is that, that is why he so quickly was able to turn around in three short years, as you say in the script, a city that was known for its racketeering. Humphrey was always there uh, in a way that you wouldn't expect. I, I'm going to tell a story that I, I've been married a long time this time, but I, I had a previous marriage that was not so long. Humphrey stopped me one day in the hall and said, I understand you're getting married and your wedding date is not on my calendar. I said to him what I'd heard from my mother-in-law to be that she would not come to the wedding if Humphrey were there. She was a, re <laughs> she was a Republican and a mean-spirited woman. And I said to him, Mr. Vice President, you're not invited. <laughs> well, you know, that's tougher than hell. <laughs> a week went by and he got his schedule again and he said to me, I got this week's schedule and your wedding is still not on it. <laughs> well, I said, Mr. Vice President, you're not invited. A third week came and we went through the same litany except I said, listen, when I tell you you're not invited, what the hell do you think I mean? You are not invited. And I then explained to him about the mother-in-law to be. And he said, oh God, I'm sorry I embarrassed you. I said, you embarrass me? No. I, and anyway, just before I was to get married on a Friday afternoon, the mother-in-law on Wednesday changed her mind. <laughs> she said it was okay if Humphrey came to the wedding. What am I going to do? I've insulted my cherished boss three times, and I suddenly have the option. I think, well, by God, I really want him there. 
And so I went to Humphrey and said, a funny thing happened. <laughs> um, you are now invited. And the wedding was less than, it was about 24 hours later. Or this was a Thursday, getting married Friday afternoon. He said, tell Vi to cancel everything on my schedule. I will be there. Well, that's beyond the call thing. And he not only came, he had had the Secret Service shift so that only my friends were on that shift, uh, the Secret Service. He came and he moved in and he had great peripheral vision. Humphrey could see a hall like this. He would see somebody move there and move there. Came in and he spotted the mother-in-law to be. <laughs> well, he moved in on her without any awkward gesture. He kissed the bride, shook my hand, whoosh, to the mother-in-law to be, and he did a number on her. She lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. If we came within 200 miles of Portsmouth after that, she showed up. <laughs> okay. <laughs>